Goodbye, trash can. Hello, cheese grater. After six years, Apple is finally back with a new Mac Pro, a total redesign from their last system. So why has it taken so long? Why the big change? And why would anyone pay $40,000 for a computer? Let's find out. Welcome back to Upscaled, our explainer show where we dig into what makes our favorite tech work. In our last episode, we took a look at how most 4K video is actually created, and I gotta say, I thought our gaming content would be polarizing, but that episode brought the cinephiles out in force. A few points from that episode that I wanted to clarify here. We heard from a number of you that films are actually frequently linked back to the original footage before the final master, a process called conforming. This means films shot with newer, ultra-high resolution cameras can really benefit from all the advantages of those extra pixels. That said, pretty much every film these days still has its VFX rendered at 2K and then scaled up to the export resolution. Beyond that, tons of movies, including recent blockbusters like Arrival, Logan, Guardians of the Galaxy, Black Panther, and Aquaman, were all shot on the Ari Alexa or the Alexa XT, which, no matter how you want to argue it, are not 4K cameras. Any 4K releases of films shot on those cameras were made from lower resolution footage, though again, it doesn't matter and they'll still look great. Also, sincerely, keep the feedback coming. We really want this show to be as accurate as possible. But that said, if you email me and tell me you know I'm wrong because my buddy is a big deal in Hollywood and he said so, I'm just not gonna take you seriously. Moving on. Today, I don't wanna talk about movies, but instead I wanna talk about a potential tool for creating them, the Mac Pro. The old Mac Pro was a small, quiet, and innovative machine, but Apple made some mistakes. If you wanna know everything that went wrong with the previous model here, let us know. There's a lot to cover, but for the moment, Basically, this design made it really difficult to upgrade. It means to this day, prospective customers and existing users are stuck with the choice of old Ivy Bridge server CPUs, DDR3 memory, and ancient AMD graphics. The new Mac Pro is a giant hunk of metal. It is 20 inches tall and weighs 40 pounds. This is a desktop, but it is definitely a desk under. That bulk is in service, though, of correcting the mistakes of its forebears. Cooling has been improved in the new Mac Pro, though Apple has made a few unusual decisions when it comes to managing heat. Under that fancy lattice front, which Apple does claim maximizes airflow, there are three large fans, which pull in air and move it past the CPU and expansion cards. And on the back, there's a fourth blower style fan, which pushes the air from around the RAM and power supply out of the case. Beyond that, there are no other fans. The CPU and GPU just use giant passive heat sinks, as does the power supply. Now, in a consumer machine, these would all have their own additional fans to help manage heat. Using fans to just push air over a bunch of heat sinks isn't actually too strange in a server, but these setups tend to use incredibly high pressure fans and they are loud. <laughs> Considering this is Apple, I just can't imagine those fans are gonna be that noisy. This means that the entire system, which has the potential to generate a lot of heat, is essentially being cooled by four fans. I'm sure Apple has done testing and this thing isn't gonna immediately overheat, but it does make me wonder how much of a margin there is for dealing with more heat in the future. Looking at this cooling system, something else comes to mind, and that is dust. There may be a dust filter somewhere in the Mac Pro that we're just not seeing in the official press materials, but from what we've been shown, there is nothing to keep this gorgeous machine from filling up with lint and animal hair. I personally clean a giant hairball out of the front of my PC's dust filter about every two weeks. It'll be interesting to see how much thermal performance degrades when end users don't clean their machines out regularly, and whether Apple even makes that cleaning process easy to do. At least the processor is upgradable and it uses Intel's server-oriented LGA 3647 socket with Xeon W series CPUs and the options for eight cores all the way up to 28 cores. Now, quick note here, if you buy this machine with eight cores, you are wasting your money. Beyond that, the new Mac Pro comes with no less than seven full-size PCI slots for add-in cards, for graphics processing, or super fast storage, and a whopping 12 slots for RAM. Speaking of RAM, that is where we're going to see some of the biggest improvements in this new system. The previous Mac Pro maxed out at 128 gigabytes of memory total, but the new Pro can take up to 128 gigs 
per slot, allowing for up to one and a half terabytes of system memory, eh, depending on your CPU choice. Part of the reason this is a pro system is it uses ECC, or Error Checking and Correction RAM, which can correct errors caused by charge particles from space and radioactive decay scrambling the memory. This is actually called a soft error, and it's more common than you might think. It's also more common in devices with more memory and where more of that memory is in use. A random crash when you're playing Overwatch? Eh, maybe not the end of the world, but a crash when you're halfway through a multi-day 3D render? Not ideal. Cinematic rendering, 3D modeling, scientific computing, and trying to open more than six tabs in Chrome, these are all tasks that use a lot of RAM. Though I really tried to find any program that could benefit from close to this amount, and well, I couldn't. High-end production software like Nuke, Maya, Cinema 4D, Redshift, and Octane all typically use 128 gigs or less. One program, Metashape, which is used to stitch together photos to make 3D models, said if you wanted to analyze 10,000 photos simultaneously at its ultra-high-res setting, that could benefit from up to 640 gigs of RAM. That said, I am sure someone will find a use for all that memory, maybe with virtual machines or AI training, but either way, having a peak spec that makes absolutely no sense is usually a good sign that you actually have a kind of flexible machine. So far, the Mac Pro is sounding a lot like a workstation-grade PC, albeit an unconventionally cooled one. But Apple is throwing in some custom hardware, too. Their Afterburner card is designed to speed up ProRes, Apple's proprietary video format, and they claim it can be used to play back three 8K video streams at once in real time. This card uses an FPGA, or a Field Programmable Gate Array. And this is another thing we'd love to do a future episode on, but basically it means Apple might be able to actually improve the architecture of this chip down the line if it wants to. The place where there is the most chance to customize the Mac Pro, though, is in its Mac Pro Expansion, or MPX modules. This consists of a pair of slots that sit next to two of the Mac Pro's PCI rails, delivering both power and extra data bandwidth. The GPUs that the Mac Pro ships with are built into a metal tube which connects to both the PCI rail and the custom MPX slot. Apple's spec sheet maxes out with the brand new 28 teraflop, 64 gigabyte AMD Radeon Pro Vega 2 Duo, which stuffs two GPUs into one card. With space for two MPX modules, that gives you up to the equivalent of four workstation graphics cards with the power to calculate almost 57 teraflops of floating point 32. For contrast, two 2080 Ti's, NVIDIA's fastest consumer card, would yield around 27 teraflops of number crunching power. But this is actually kind of a dubious proposition. Some professional rendering apps like V-Ray can get a big boost from a second GPU, but most programs have drastically diminishing returns for GPUs 3 and 4. That said, we don't know much yet about this new Vega 2 Pro Duo card, and it's possible applications will be able to read it as just one big graphics processor, though that kind of depends on how well Apple and AMD are able to wrangle all those multiple GPUs. One thing is certain though, all those GPUs are going to take a lot of power, and those MPX modules are designed to deliver up to 500 watts of juice. For context, the last Mac Pro had a 450 watt power supply for the entire system, but the new Mac Pro comes with a bonkers 1.4 kilowatt power supply. But despite all this power, I'm still a little concerned. Now, in a traditional PC, graphics cards get some power, about 75 watts, from the PCI slot that they used to connect to the motherboard, and the rest comes directly from the system's power supply via one or two 8-pin connectors, which each deliver another 150 watts. In the case of the MPX module, it's delivering its 500 watts through a combination of PCI and the new proprietary MPX slot. But as far as we can tell, there are no cables anywhere in this computer, and thus no 8-pin power connectors. Apple does imply it might offer an adapter that will plug into the MPX port and come with two standard 8-pin connectors, but we don't know if these will come with the machine, or when they'll be available, or how much they'll cost. Aside from graphics, we also know Apple is allowing some third parties to manufacture MPX modules, with storage company Promise announcing a 32 terabyte MPX module that crams four 8 terabyte drives into one module. 
Considering this, it's pretty easy to imagine a scenario where your MPX ports are taken up with graphics and storage modules, and that leaves the system's four remaining PCI expansion slots without the option for extra power. Now, some basic PCI cards like sound devices or the ones that enable additional USB ports are fine with the 75 watts of power the motherboard can provide, but power over ethernet or high-powered capture cards or video encoders and deep learning and AI accelerators often require those extra power cables. Beyond that, the MPX system also makes me nervous that we are in for a repeat of the last Mac Pro with its highly custom build. This computer launched with two custom AMD cards that fit into special slots, and then Apple and AMD never made new ones. In a similar way, users of the new system might be reliant on Apple and AMD to engineer new graphics cards that they can use to upgrade their very expensive computers. And even beyond the GPU, what happens when Intel revises its CPU socket? Will Apple redesign and sell new motherboards? Cause with this computer, they never did. Considering this is a fully custom design, doing anything like this will probably take a lot of work. For another example, PCI 4.0 is also on the horizon, which will enable storage with speeds over four gigabytes a second, but the Mac Pro currently uses the last generation 3.0. Is that gonna ever see an upgrade? Using custom parts does create new possibilities that we haven't seen before, but it also locks you into a system. And the last time around, that system was almost immediately abandoned. This time could be different, but it's not something I'd want to count on. Until these machines actually get released, that's pretty much all there is to say right now. But let us know what you think about this new Apple hardware, and were you someone who ever owned a previous Mac Pro? Or are you thinking about actually buying the new model? Sound off in the comments and be sure to subscribe. If all goes well, we'll be back in a few weeks with a breakdown of everything new with AMD. How did they cram all those tiny transistors into their new chips?